Hi guys, Olive here. Here today to wrap up my reading for the final month of 2018. I started the month off with two holiday, or at least holiday-ish reads. The first of those was Holidays on Ice by David Sedaris. Per his usual style, this is an essay collection, but not per his usual style. They are fictional essays that take place during the holiday season. Normally his essay collections are always funny stories from his own life, but in this book they are stories of some really over-the-top holiday occurrences. For instance, there are several different essays about his fictional experience of being one of Santa's elves at Macy's. And then there's another story that I did really enjoy about two well-off families in the suburbs who are trying to out-charity each other during the holiday season, a competition that escalates to donating organs. As I always seem to find with David Sedaris books, either I find an essay hysterically funny or it flops entirely. There is no in between, and every single book I've read of his has a combination of those two. The examples I gave before were essays that I enjoyed, but I did find him in this book particularly using slurs for mentally handicapped people very, very frequently. If you didn't know, I was raised by a single mother who was a special education teacher for 20 years. I spent a lot of time with her students because she was raising me as a single parent and we didn't have a whole lot of money for childcare. So that kind of stuff just doesn't fly with me. So elements of this I did find funny, but in general, I would not recommend it. But in December, I also did reread a book that always delivers, which is Bridget Jones's Diary by Helen Fielding. I associate this book so strongly with Christmas. It starts around the new year when Bridget is starting her diary and then we go through the entire calendar year and it wraps up around the holiday season. So the fact that it is bookended by the holidays at the beginning and ending of the book, and the fact that I've read this book three different times now, always around the holiday season, has it inextricably linked to Christmas in my mind. This is a classic work of what's typically called chiclet, which I can never decide how I feel about that terminology, but it is a 90s retelling of Pride and Prejudice. If Lizzie Bennet was a 30-something with infinitely less self-assurance, I don't even know how to describe this book if you've never read it. It's funny, it's silly, it's lighthearted, but also a ton of fun to read. I had an extremely difficult month in December, and this book lifted my spirits in a way that it always manages to. But then I moved on to read some books that were actually on my December TBR, beginning with Saw Kill Girls by Claire Legrand. This was a buddy read that I did with Brit. This is a YA book that has elements of horror and of the paranormal. It has three point of view characters, Marion, Zoe, and Val. Marion is new to Saw Kill Island, where this book takes place, having just moved there with her mother and her sister after the very recent death of her father. And just about as soon as they arrive, Marion realizes something just isn't right about this island. First of all, teenage girls have been disappearing on this island for years, and yet no one really treats it like a big deal. But it is a big deal for Zoe, whose best friend is the most recent girl who has disappeared, and she blames her best friend's disappearance on our third main character, Val. Val is a slave to the darkness that haunts this island, and is granted a power over people in exchange for her obedience. But the island has a will of its own and is using newcomer Marion to plan its retaliation against this monster that, if left unchecked, will consume everything in its path. Like most YA books that I've read, this book is really fast paced. It is definitely a page turner. It has a really imaginative story. But I do think that certain elements weren't fully thought out, mainly when it comes to the side character motivations. And there wasn't enough development of the relationships between these three main characters to make later happenings in the book believable. So while I'm not sorry I read this book, it was a good time, it was nothing spectacular. The next book I read off of my December TBR was The Little Stranger by Sarah Waters. As I mentioned in that TBR video, I have closed out the past three years now reading a Sarah Waters book. This has worked out really well for me. It usually ends up resulting in the book being a last minute addition to my favorite fiction books of the year list but I guess this year was out of the usual. This is the story of a country doctor who was called to a stately yet deteriorating old house that he had actually visited and marveled at when he was a child, but this was when the house and the family who resides within it were in their prime. But since then, he has grown up into a doctor who is just scraping by financially, and the resident family of Hundreds Hall have 
lost their eldest child, seen another badly injured during a plane crash in World War II, and felt their wealth and their home start to crumble down around them. The doctor begins to become friendly with this family as weird things start to go down in the house, which does turn this story into more of a ghost story. Now, Sarah Waters is a beautiful writer. She never fails to generate an amazing atmosphere in her books by putting things just so, but there was no meat on the bones of this story. The characters acted really bizarrely at times and not in a way of like they're under the influence of a spirit. It was really boring by the end and had it been written by someone with less skill than Sarah Waters, I probably would have ended up putting it down. I was similarly let down by her latest book, The Paying Guest, which was actually the first Sarah Waters book I ever read, but I actually think I liked this one less. It is certainly not her best in my opinion. I also went on to watch the recent movie adaptation of this book because I was interested and was vaguely considering doing one of those movie to book comparison videos that I have been doing more of lately. But although I loved Ruth Wilson in the movie, the guy who played the main character, the doctor, was so boring. He made one facial expression the entire time, and when he was forced to put a smile on his face during the scenes that required it, it looked like that was the first time he had ever smiled and felt very uncomfortable with the sensation on his face. So unfortunately, I was very unimpressed with both the book and the movie. Very disappointing. A book that I finally finished this month after having abandoned it in February for no good reason at all was Red Clocks by Lainey Zumas. This was a 2018 release that was pretty widely discussed and praised across literary fiction booktube. It is a work of speculative fiction, but in the non-science fiction fantasy kind of way. It's set in a world where embryos are granted rights. So in vitro fertilization, abortion, anything that affects a fetus are outlawed. There is also another law in the works as this book goes along that will prohibit single people from adopting children, claiming that every child needs to. We are introduced to a group of women who are all affected by these laws in different ways, but who all pretty equally feel the weight of society's expectations on them as women. I would say the character at the center of this story is Roe, who is a single woman. She is a teacher. She is also writing a biography about a female polar explorer. She desperately wants to have a child, but these laws are preventing her from having one. We also meet a teenager who falls pregnant and does not want to be. We meet a mother of two who is in a very bad marriage, and we meet a witch doctor who is connected to all of them. I wish I had more to say about this book because I did enjoy it, but I felt like it was on the edge of something and never quite got there. The premise is certainly terrifying, and I did like the undercurrent of a rivalry between Roe and the mother of two children, because each wants what the other one has. And this illustrates that this world that Zuma's created makes it impossible for women to win, not fully unlike our own world. So throughout the book, I did feel like there were some good conversation pieces brewing, but certain elements got in the way of this being the thought-provoking, powerful story that I was so ready for it to be. In particular, the polar explorer sections. I did not care about them at all. They were hard to follow and felt entirely unrelated. I'm sure they were put there for a reason, but I didn't know or care to know what the reason was. And for me, that's a failure of the book that the author didn't generate that interest in those major sections. It's too big of a failure of the book to overlook, in my opinion. My feelings on this book are so middling that I can't even fully say if I recommend it or not. It's kind of like a beige book. Another book that I finally got around to reading was An Act of Villainy by Ashley Weaver. This is the fifth book in my favorite cozy mystery series. This book has our main character Amory Ames and her husband Milo actually requested by a high society acquaintance to look into some threatening letters that his actress mistress is receiving ahead of her debut performance. Who could want to see her fall? A scorned former lover? The furious snubbed wife? the ambitious understudy. It asks the same questions as any mystery would with a theater backdrop, but it does pull out some surprises and has the same great dynamic between Milo and Amory that I have come to know and love. If you like cozy mysteries, I highly recommend you pick up this series. It begins with Murder at the Brightwell. As always, this book was a delight to read and a great addition to the series. The last book that I will discuss in full in this wrap up is Russian Winter by Daphne Colote. 
On paper, this book is about an elderly Russian woman, a former star ballerina of Stalin's Soviet Union, who is now living in Boston and is auctioning off her jewelry to support the arts. But we also have two other main characters in this book. One of them is a divorced 30-something woman who is working at the auction house who's going to hold this jewelry auction. She is doing research on the ballerina Nina's life out of her own curiosity and also to put on all the literature that they will distribute at the auction. But we also follow a professor of Russian who anonymously provides a missing piece of a set of Nina's jewelry. He knows he's connected to Nina somehow, but doesn't quite know how. In the book, we get the backstories of all these characters. We get to learn of their current struggles and see how they are all connected. It's a very well-written book, but it is entirely too long and lacks the research to make it a good historical novel. If you're going to set something in Stalin's Russia, especially if you're going to mention The Whisperers by Orlando Figues in your notes section as a work that you consulted for this book, then there needs to be a visceral feeling of fear throughout your book. Not just like, oh, I think the room is bugged, but I guess we'll keep drinking. Or, oh, the police are following me, so I should probably start associating with someone patriotic. I think the author of this book, like many authors, liked the idea of setting something in Russia but didn't do enough research, so just left things out. You could definitely feel from reading this that the characters and the ballet were her focus, and so those elements were done well, but the Russian elements may as well not have been there. Compared with something like Sana Krasikov's ambitious historical novel The Patriots, which does Stalinist Russia so well, this one just doesn't deliver. Read The Patriots instead. Now moving on to the books that I have either previously discussed or have DNF'd. I did an entire review of Last Call, The Rise and Fall of Prohibition by Daniel Ockrentz. This is a big, comprehensive history of the 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which for 13 years at the beginning of the 20th century banned the production and sale of intoxicating liquors until it was repealed in 1933 by the 21st Amendment. This book will tell you everything you may want or even need to know about this massive failure of a social experiment, but it will also tell it to you in the most illuminating and entertaining way. I thought it was great and decided to celebrate the repeal of Prohibition, which was at the beginning of December, by reviewing this book while taking shots of moonshine. It was my one and only drunk review of the year, and I will link it down below in case you missed it. And my one DNF of the month was actually the random pick off of my TBR for December, which was The Thousand Autumns of Jakob de Zoet by David Mitchell. On the other side of the spectrum from Russian Winter in the Research Department, this book is historical information disguised as a novel. Jakob de Zoet is a Dutch bookkeeper who in 1799 is brought by his company to their location in Japan to clean up operations. What he discovers there is a crap ton of corruption, which he eventually ends up getting screwed over by. And out of nowhere, he becomes infatuated with a Japanese woman. She is a doctor's assistant who also acts as a midwife. This book is hands down one of the most boring things I have ever read, and that includes schoolwork. 90% of the dialogue in this book is historical info dumping, and it is absolutely chock full of complicated and uninteresting late 18th century bureaucracy. I'm sorry, but slow moving scheming when it comes to paperwork is not thrilling in the slightest. And Jakob de Zoet as a character is just an overly starched shirt. He's by turns uptight or puppy dog eyes over a woman he does not know. Then the book out of nowhere takes a hard right and starts to be about a mysterious cult in the mountains. I eventually decided that I respect my time too much to waste it on a book that's this much of a slog. I'm not giving up entirely on David Mitchell, but this was not a good introduction. So those were all the books that I read or at least attempted to read in the last month of 2018. I now realize it was not that successful of a reading month, but that's okay. January is already going a whole lot better. If you've read any of these books or want to read any of these books, I certainly do hope I haven't talked you out of reading every single book that I attempted this month. You can put that in the comment section below or if you'd prefer to chat with me somewhere other than YouTube, I am on a variety of different places on social media. The links to all of my profiles are linked in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope 2019 is treating you well so far, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!